Hi, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here today. My name is Samantha Weaver, and I am the co-chair of the AAMS Fifth Congress. And if you're tuning in from wherever you are, it's wonderful to have you. We have a really wonderful lineup of speakers and experts from around the world who are joining us here today for an AAMS forum, Baby Mayo. This has really been a work in progress and it still is a work in progress. The goal of today's panel is to get some ideas down for the idea of a white paper. And that would be a reference tool from the AAMS, which is the Academy of Applied Myofunctional Sciences to the rest of the world and medical community as reference points in how we look and care for infants into peds. So today what we're going to do is actually hear from experts all around the world and we're going through several stages of development. We're starting with preconception and going into gestation, zero to six months, six to 12 months, the toddler years, and finally the preschool years. So what we are really doing today is getting experts who have uh, treatment modalities in these windows of development to weigh in on how to apply myofunctional science and its treatment modalities so that we can actually help our babies and enable our babies to live to their full potential. Obviously, there are many functions involved. So what I am going to weave together are different critical disciplines that look at different functions and development. And we're going to kick off today with our first panelist, Robin Glass. Robin, it's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for being a part of our panel. And we are really excited that you're participating. You have so much experience, namely in the um, infant and pediatric world. And as an occupational therapist, I know that your viewpoint in the development is uh, something that you've dedicated your life to. So I would love to invite you to share uh, your perception and perspective around how we can answer some of the questions that were um, delivered earlier. Before you start, I think we should just go over what those general questions are that we're looking at here today. What is the first stage of identification of a potential for a myofunctional disorder? How does intervention look and how, what disciplines are involved? Who provides screening and intervention? And how can we support the NICU and invite more collaborative treatment mo modalities inside? Um, how can we improve screening and precon preconception checklists for mothers who are carrying. These are just some of the questions that we're posing and I am inviting all of our speakers to step in and really share what they perceive as their um, ideas around how we can better serve not just the medical community but parents and the caregivers that are really helping our children develop. Robin. Good morning. Good morning from Seattle, Washington. I'm Robin Glass. I'm an occupational therapist and a lactation consultant. My primary workspace is at Seattle Children's Hospital, which is a quaternary level hospital that serves the uh, Northwest and certainly beyond. I work in the NICU as well as throughout the first year of life. So I have a good perspective of the almost preconception baby, those babies who are born very early. And what I would like to add to this discussion today is really to think about the role of the respiratory interventions that we do, our life-saving interventions in the NICU, and how they set off for babies, uh, set them off on the wrong track of development in terms of their oral health 
and their breathing after they recover from their um, uh, prematurity and their illnesses. We see so many of babies on respiratory support with an open mouth posture. And so for those of us working in the NICUs, OTs, PTs, speech therapists, nurses, physicians, we need to begin to think about how, as part of our overall interventions with these babies, not only develop oral skills for feeding functions, which is what these babies need first line, but how this is going to affect them all along the lifespan. And so those are the things I think we need to begin to consider and build into our practice. And I have a question based on um, when you're working inside a NICU, what is that like um, in terms of the messages and how things are communicated? I know it's a high intensity environment. It's a lot of emergency um, situations. And I'm just curious to know, um, you know, what is the standard uh, team that really serves the infants just from a, from the public point of view a lot of us don't even know who's inside and what their jobs are mm -hmm. absolutely so in NICUs you really have a variety of teams and specialties um, in the neonatal intensive care, uh, the attendings tend to be uh, neonatologists or neonatal nurse practitioners. In the cardiac intensive care, of course, they have different specialists as well, and we have babies in all of these areas. Then you have your bedside nurses and your respiratory therapist and those providers. And then a whole range of specialists, both attending specialists for special needs for each individual baby, as well as some level of therapists in around the country and around the world. That can vary whether you have PTs, OTs, speech therapists, a combination. So it can be a wide range of people. But the overarching thing of all NICUs these days is really um, family-centered care. So the parents are an integral part of what's going on. And to address your question, I think one of the things we need to do for parent-centered care is really think about how and when we bring in these issues of long-lasting health effects, because that um, there are there are timing of issues that we need to consider. When you're working with parents, and um, I just I know as a parent in a heightened state of an event, um, I'm wondering who are supporting the parents to understand kind of what they need to do and what kind of um, care for the parents that you see. Um, exists and could be improved upon? Or is it really based on the hospital and different policies? Well, each, um, each hospital really has their own ways of bringing in parental support. Um, certainly hospitals that look towards family-centered care, supporting the parents in all aspects of care, social, emotional, physical, that is brought into the level of care. So it really mm -hmm. depends on how your hospital does that, but that's an underlying core, is really shepherding th the parents through and partnering with them in terms of this difficult time. And um, when you are asked to step in, are you, um, in collaboration mostly with the team members in the NICU or outside of that situation? Um, or does it just vary depending on the case? It really varies. We certainly collaborate with all of the NICU team, but in my personal practice, we see babies everywhere in the hospital because we are a children's hospital. And so there's a wide range of specialties. In addition for my practice, I span the inpatient to outpatient. So I really can see what happens to these babies when they go home and then collaborate with community providers at all levels. Well, I appreciate you kind of painting this picture because 
it's such a confusing time if you're a mother or a father and you're, um, you don't really know all the support that you may have in these situations. Lactation is a huge part of that. And um, I want to take a minute to introduce our lead panelists who are also involved in these aspects. Um, Katrina Rogers is here from the UK and London, and she has a specialty practice in dysphagia. And she's been, as the AAMS secretary, she's uh, reached out to many of you and communicated with you, but she is an expert in uh, pediatrics and looking at how dysphagia interrupts some of these processes. And also Michelle Emanuel, who is an occupational therapist who also has uh, developed a program called the Tummy Time Method. And I'll have her speak in a few minutes about what that is essentially addressing. Um, so um, before we get to the rest of our panelists, I just want to say to Robin, thank you um, for weighing in. Again, if you're just tuning in, the purpose of our forum today is to really put these ideas into a document that's going to be a white paper. And the white paper is on behalf of the Academy of Myofunctional Sciences. And these are looking at the functions in these early years, mainly in the stomatonathic system, mostly revolving around the chewing, the respiration and the swallowing, but many other systems as well. So that's what our forum here is today. And so uh, Robin, I know you have um, patients to tend to. So thank you for um, being a part of this and we will be following up as we get further into this process. Thank you so much um, for inviting me uh, onto, the, onto the panel. And um, I am, um, uh, have worked with with babies. I work um, and uh, in NICU and pediatric um, uh, wards and community um, clinics as well. Um, dipping in and out, and um, uh, my, our hospital is a, a local hospital. It's not a big teaching hospital, and um, so uh, in NICU certainly there are different levels of care and. Um, Within our um, ho hospital, we um, anticipate to work together right behind. Um, we have really good teamwork, teamwork um, together. I think that some of the issues in the discussion um, that we're talking about today is um, quite often um, hospitals, um, healthcare settings can be very, very busy places um, and there is never enough time in treating and managing um, the patients that we see. But um, I think at the heart of everybody's work is to look after um, parents and families to the best of our ability. Um, and I think that actually um, to, to look at improving and thinking about baby myo we do need to spend more time thinking about how we work as a as a multidisciplinary team um, quite often in, in an acute setting such as a, a NICU um, or a special care baby unit they're high pressure environments where it's um, looking at um, uh, the levels of care um, so saving the baby um, and, and um, uh, working through that, which can be highly, highly charged emotionally um, for parents and families. And that kind of medical environment with the best will in the world, parents can feel de-skilled. And it's very artful for um, the units that we work in to look after um, our, our mums, some of them are new mums, so they need extra special care. And um, it's having therapists and professionals walk alongside and, and um, nurse, nursing staff um, who all do a fabulous job. Well, I was going to say, Katrina, um, I want to come back to you and what you're describing because it really does land into the functions and primarily in what you're looking at in the swallowing functions. Um, I also know that as we are creating 
uh, kind of a landscape of who we are serving the the parents absolutely the child and then there's this collaborative team that's coming in when time is short and there's an urgency and it's uh, it's like you said a very highly emotionally charged environment um, i wanted to ask if our panelist well uh, isabel filiozat can step in for a moment uh, and weigh in on how she perceives some of these highly emotionally charged situations when it comes to the developing child and the family system. Um, Isabel Filiozat is a parent educator. She's a clinical psychologist with, um, who's dedicated her life to educating and supporting parents and children and how they um, can serve each other's needs better. So Isabel, it's wonderful to have you. You're here um, from France and you have been appointed by the French Commission to look at the first 1000 days and how we can better support um, the publicity that we all need to understand the critical timing of these developmental years. Isabel. Yes, thank you, Samantha. Hello to everybody. Yes, I'm a psychotherapist and uh, specialized in, uh, in in parenting, in positive parenting. Positive parenting means uh, uh, taking care of the needs of the children and the needs of the parents. So I give workshops, I give lectures, I hear a lot the parents and what they say, what they complain about. And parenting is really difficult. Sometimes uh, when things go are not as fluid as they could be, well, uh, parent, it can be really exhausting. So when children have uh, oral facial issues, have tongue issues, they, they cry more, they sleep less, uh, they eat less, they, they are fussy. So their growth is not uh, as uh, fluid as it could be. And parents just are uh, powerless. They don't know what to do. And uh, they try to do many things. They try many things. Uh, and they often think that it's uh, emotional, it's psychological. But no, some, uh, it has a psychological impact, yes. But when there is a, an impairment of the body, when the child is not able uh, to suck correctly, he, when he is not able to eat correctly, when he is not able to sleep correctly because he is uh, awakened because uh, he can't breathe sometimes, well, when there is an issue in the orofacial uh, thing, so uh, of course he cannot be at his full potential. He's not as joyful as it could be and the relationship may be difficult. So to prevent uh, parental anxiety, to prevent burnout, to prevent maternal depression, we really need to set more detection of the orofacial problems. We need to be able to, uh, to see a very, very young age uh, if there is a problem. We need to be able to address, we need to train people uh, to address those specific problems. We really need to, um, to, to uh, um, uh, set something that uh, uh, we can address all this myofunction, orofacial, uh, all this area correctly. So it means detection and treatment when necessary, but also education. Education at a very large, um, uh, large scale, uh, so that people understand the importance of uh, uh, breathing, breathing through the nose and not through the mouth, that people understand the very, the, the importance of uh, the position of the tongue. So those are well, I mean, everybody should know those things, but uh, it's for the moment it's not uh, not enough known. So we need uh, to uh, help babies have a body in with full capacities, because when you have an impaired breast, impaired swallowing, it induces many many painful problems, including behavioral, emotional problems. So. 
really, I hope we can uh, do something and I'm really engaged in uh, changing things and in helping people understand the importance of uh, uh, really very early treatment, very early addressing those issues. Well, I really do appreciate your uh, understanding of what psychologists also need to understand about breathing, because while we're in a field that's physiologic in nature, it's really this bridge that we are always running between the physiology and the biochemistry of breathing and how that actually affects the body from a physiologic point of view. So the heart rate acceleration, the anxiety that is uh, a condition that is elevated when there's oral breathing and not just for the babies, but for the parents even. And we're really looking at the family system of how we can support these highly charged times, which is really what it is when you have a baby, whether you have had five or zero, um, Mm -hmm. it's a, a whole battle between what was old and new and everybody is new to the table when there's a baby born. So um, I really do appreciate the educational um, call to action to help psychologists, but also other areas get understanding about the physiologic, psychological impact of breathing. And uh, thank you so much because I know you do so much to support parents families and to do that in a positive way and i appreciate all that you do in that arena Um, i want to move on to our next speaker and i will come back to our lead panelists in a moment Um, but solveig thorpe holmsom is a medical doctor it's wonderful to have you you have a, a hugely curious mind and it's what propelled you into studying and excavating myofunctional sciences around the world taking classes and really bringing this information back to your region where you can communicate these elements and when we look at myofunctional sciences it's it's you know, we have a PR problem. Myofunctional sciences refers to the muscles and the sciences that support these functions around chewing, breathing, swallowing. So uh, Solveig, it's wonderful to have you here today. I'm really curious about your insight and where you are in this discussion and what you've learned and what you want to bring back and what you have brought back. Yeah, Mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for inviting me to join this panel and um, I, I'm an MD from Norway and I started out working with uh, women that wanted to treat women with mastitis in a better way uh, and then I ended up finding that uh, tongue ties could cause mastitis in many of those uh, cases and uh, then I wanted to, uh, to learn more about tongue ties, how to diagnose them and how to treat them uh, and I did learn that and um, and then we saw the, uh, we saw the connection between the tongue ties, the oral uh, dysfunction, uh, the breathing problem, the stress uh, of the baby, and that also made the parents stressed. And uh, of course, the, the baby couldn't have, in many cases, couldn't have enough uh, milk to drink and swallow, a swallowing problem. We saw tube-fed uh, babies. Uh, and uh, there, there was not uh, the understanding of this uh, connection is not in place in my country so no one can see that connection but when you really see it it's so clear so I, I just wanted to 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 uh, get that information out uh, and uh, of course, I've taken courses. I learned uh, about how to treat the tongue ties, about my functional therapy, and uh, I want to get the news out. So I have written a knowledge-based uh, guidance document in Norwegian that will soon be published uh, about diagnosing and treating tongue ties in, in breastfeeding infants. And uh, we needed that in my country, in Norway, because... Uh, 
uh, most uh, doctors didn't see the tongue tie as a problem at all. And we found that it was really a big problem for breastfeeding and uh, caused a lot of breastfeeding uh, uh, problems. And also we found that these tube fed babies that could not swallow. And uh, I really recognize uh, you, you, what you uh, talk about, Katerina, in your presentation. And, uh, and there are many of them. And some of them are even uh, reported to the Child Protection Services Agency uh, because uh, the doctors do not understand the problem. And they think that it's the parents that are causing this problem and that it's in the parents, uh, that it's a psychological problem in the parents. Uh, and when you find that it's this tongue tie and you just need to get that, uh, that fixed, you just need to have, but you need to have this uh, done in a, in a good manner to get a good result. So you need uh, the multi, uh, the multi, you, you need to have cooperation, collaboration with the, with the physical therapist or body worker and uh, with an as SLP. And there are not many uh, professionals in my region that uh, are good at this. So all of them are really, really busy helping these uh, infants and babies and uh, toddlers. And, uh, uh, but it's not well known. The, the connection here? It's, you know, this is just a, a universal gap in how parents are supposed to act or even have the understanding of what a tongue tie is or isn't. And from this, I believe a lot of social media has heightened this kind of interest in tongue tie and how it impacts feeding, but we know from even research and a lot of the presentations that have been provided inside the AAMS Congress, the, the feeding is one step of how this tongue impacts the functional lifespan. And it happens in utero. So when that baby is born, it uh, oftentimes has a high narrow palate. And these are things that we're starting to piece together as a medical community to better understand what tongue tie does, not just from a feeding perspective, which is what historically it has been looked at, and also within the speech world, but really how tongue tie influences the shape of the head and face and eventually the entire skeletal form. So it's really interesting that you have gone uh, Solveig into the world, brought it back. You've met resistance. And I think that this resistance is actually universal depending on the gaps of knowledge, whether you're in, you're in Norway or here in the United States. There are some people who really just don't believe in the treatment because there's not enough research. So I'm asking, what do you think you need as a clinician, medical doctor to elevate the awareness of tongue tie from your point of view? I think information out to the public and to the parents is really important because they can demand that the, that the medical professionals know more about this. Um, I think uh, that is a good way in, but also that to make uh, the medical uh, doctors and the colleagues and the dentists more interested in this uh, and the connection and that, that they also see the connection and more and more of my colleagues do that. So, uh, so, so I think we, we are getting some progress, but it's uh, a little slow, but uh, we are getting there. And again, I think the public is really driving the need for clinicians to come to the table because a lot of this information is being shared across channels, whether it's social media channels or personal patient stories or the consequences of a tongue tie that shows up later on in one's life. Uh, these are certain aspects that I know are being driven by the public and the fact that they didn't get the care they needed early on. Uh, I want to take a moment and ask Eyal Boatser to step in since you are such a 
expert and have so much experience in the management and treatment of tongue tie. Um, Eyal Boatstart joins us from Tel Aviv. And as a pediatric dentist and uh, beyond, you're really serving this window of time in the developing child, whether the infant, but also with the mother. And I'm wondering what your perception is, having done over 20,000 procedures of tongue tie. How do you feel that this field or this collective is advancing and what does it need to do to get to the next step? Hi, Samantha. Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, I want to discuss the, the fact that I see the babies with the breastfeeding issues, mostly when they are at the hospital, not necessarily the NICU. So I think every neonatal unit, uh, not necessarily the uh, intensive care, but every regular delivery room, uh, not delivery room, but the neonatal department should be aware of the, of the effect of the myofunctional uh, anomalies on, on function. And the first thing that I get involved in is the tongue tie. And we have a team, we have established a team at our hospital at the Tel Aviv Medical Center, where every child is being ev evaluated by a lactation consultant. And we also have a, an osteopath on the team. And then we try to get the full coverage of, the, of first identifying where the, the difficulty is resulting from whether it's anatomical, whether it's positional, whether it's, uh, it needs a, a small surgery of, uh, of a phrenotomy. And this is done on the very first days of life. It is done for the babies in our hospital, and some of them are being only followed. We use the Martinelli criteria, the Marcus and Martinelli criteria to, to distinguish the babies. And we do miracles on babies that are not being uh, breastfed and mothers that are suffering. We can change them into breastfed babies and happy mothers. And it's not always a miracle because it's a multifactorial problem. And we need to have this team to assess and treat. And I think the, very, the first stage that we should uh, start to do the identification of the potential problem is immediately after birth. Maybe in the future we'll have a pre-delivery, um, like in utero screening. And I've seen some ultrasound screening that show a tongue tie. Uh, but so far we need to wait for the delivery and have the child being evaluated by the, unfortunately, not the pediatrician at this phase, maybe in the future. So you should be there at the delivery room. Uh, but have the, the pediatricians and the nurses and the lactation consultants be aware and know what we should look for. And we should look for impairment of the breastfeeding and breathing. A child that is born and he breathes through his mouth, it should have a red alert to the, to the staff. And now the question is when should we intervene? So it, right, right there. And the intervention should look like, depending on the result, where is the result? What is the origin of the problem? Is it uh, positional? So we'll work with a body worker and, and get the baby more symmetrical. If he has a tongue tie, have the surgery and the right timing. If it is some kind of a, a neuromuscular issue or, or reflexes or cranial nerve issues, have them get the treatment before. And the screening should be done. Well, everyone should be aware of the of the potential problem and try to identify it, but there always should be a team leader. And in my opinion, the team leader is the lactation consultant. Unfortunately, now the pediatricians in Israel, they get very little training in breastfeeding. So, well, they are like the, inst the highest inst instance, but they hardly know as much as the lactation consultant knows. So we should start with a team leader at the hospital and then the parents should know that when they go out to, of the hospital to the community, they should be forwarded to a, to a team leader there. Usually it's the lactation consultant, somebody that should, someone that should follow the child and the family 
train the mothers or uh, instruct them and put up the red alerts when they are uh, when when they show. And this way, it's a continuous uh, follow-up of the of the child and the family, and finding whenever they go off track as soon as possible, and then try to put them on tracks again. So it's a teamwork, and this team starts immediately following uh, delivery, and it involves many uh, professionals, and each time some uh, another professional is taking the lead. When they get a little older, it should be the a speech pathologist, maybe the myofunctional therapist, uh, and that's it. It should be done as soon as possible and with trained personnel. Hey, Al, um, can you tell us a little bit about the climate and culture that supports breastfeeding in Israel? And it's such a cultural basis for different countries have higher rates of breastfeeding than others. What is the rate that you see in, in Israel? The rate in Israel is very similar to the US. Well, they try, about 97% of the mothers try to breastfeed at the hospital. Unfortunately, 76% of them get supplements, get formula. So the, the, the ideal is not being reached. Uh, People know that they should try to breastfeed. Mothers want to breastfeed. However, the supporting environment is not really supporting because we do need to educate the, the pediatricians. And we have at our hospital, we have pretty good support to the mothers, but we still need uh, much more support by the, by the community, by the pediatricians outside that should be educated about the tongue tie issues and not see the lactation consultants as a cult, that the only thing that is interesting them is to have the mother breastfeed at any cost. And they are not aware of the, uh, of the advantages on, on, <clears throat> on facial development of breastfeeding and, and breathing. So we I have a lot of education to do even in Israel. I believe that is such a big gap in basic knowledge that is disseminated is that the breastfeeding is really serving a nutritional need for the child, but there's so much more involved. And I think that part of the equation is really lost. I know when I went in for my first checkup with my OBGYN, the head office uh, assistant essentially said, well, we'll see you in a few weeks. And she gave me a bag of Similac products. And she said, you know, here, take it. It's free. And so the early, you know, exposure to this gap between what is breastfeeding serving, it's not just a nutritional benefit. We know that it impacts the, the muscles and the mechanics of breastfeeding really serves the development of the face, jaw, and consequently the airway and breathing and how the whole body grows. And I think that is a big gap in how pediatricians, OBGYNs, offices are set up. And I know Robert Lustig is here in our panel and he'll weigh in on this aspect of the equation. So I was really curious about how breastfeeding is supported and what is really disseminated in the, the benefits in Israel. So um, one is, more thing. Yeah, go ahead. It is, today it's banned to, to provide uh, artificial uh, nutrition to the mothers immediately. It's only a, like a last resort should be. But as I said, it's about 75% of the mothers do get it. Uh, babies do get it during their stay at the hospital. So we have, we know what we should, what should be done, but we are so far from it. And I want to ask Michelle Emanuel to uh, step into this because you work so closely in this period of time. I know you and Ayal have collaborated across the seas and how best to support the baby function. Michelle Emanuel, this forum is really your baby because I know for years you have really dedicated your life to how to administer the right treatment 
whether it's called baby myo or other modalities to really serve that developing child. And as an occupational therapist, you are a leader, you're a voice of education, and you disseminate so many pearls of wisdom along the way. I'm curious if you can uh, weigh in just what happens when Michelle is called to the table and what is the picture when your services are uh, required? Thank you for having me. Thank you, everybody. I am very honored to be here as a part of the team. And yes, this is a part of my baby. It took a lot of us to state it. <laughs> and it's just, and what we're trying to do is continue to focus on collaboration and communication. So I'm a part of the family's team member. Usually they come to me. My background is working for 17 and a half years at a large children's hospital in the NICU and the CCU and even an outpatient. So I have a breadth and scope and a lot of experience with both the high acuity and then lesser kind of developmental things like torticollis and the head molding and uh, reflux and colic and that type of thing. Now, I've been in private practice full time for five years, and it's been a big switch on some levels and a big awareness for me that my entire clientele really adds to the continuum of healthcare crises that our children are having that many of the babies and most of them that I see are considered typically developing children and there haven't been any concerns raised despite what I notice functionally like suboptimal breastfeeding which is our first indicator and as an occupational therapist even when I first began in this field many years ago they told us that hey babies that have feeding problems um, early on have a way higher risk of having developmental problems to keep our closer on this population and I remember that and so that's the big thing but other things are more subtle that people don't have awareness and education like open mouth posture and low oral facial tone and undiagnosed smaller jaws or retracted jaws and really even babies who are seemingly getting by with weight gain and growth not having good functional mechanics and components of feeding. And that over time changes uh, the structure, like you were mentioning, of the head and the palate and the whole body and how neural development either it matures and moves along or it hits a lot of barriers and snags. And it seems like since our tongue is the epicenter of development, that we need to trace all of the problems that we do see body-wide back to the tongue. We also need to realize that throughout gestation, this was the body and the posture and the shaping, and even to an extent the breathing patterns are developing in utero. And so the bigger change when we come out is the intensity with gravity. And we have some other cultural barriers and a lot of it is just that we need to get some information and education and awareness out there. But um, we're seeing a lot of breathing dysfunction that is underneath the bar of being diagnosed, like um, squeaky breathing and uh, a lot of noisy breathing or congestion even. Um, babies that do a lot of snoring and babies that have um, excessive hiccups in their body, which is disrupting to their nervous system. And when we have, you know, babies, we regulate our nervous system early on um, especially right at birth in this early period in the fourth trimester through ingestive vagal reflexes, meaning that we use sucking and swallowing and breathing and the coordination of that to regulate our nervous system. And not just to keep us calm, but to make us be able to face that next challenge. And so this is how the nervous system is learning how to learn. So it's the foundation of what affects us for the rest of our life. And many of these babies, all of these babies have this disrupted early primary rest, um, regulator of the nervous system. And so that sets off a kilter for sensory integration dysfunction, which I see a lot of different times of types of sensory sensitivities. Um, we see all kinds of cranial shaping and flattening and molding and asymmetries and postural things that really go underneath the radar of many pediatricians. And so there's a lot to do 
and I'm so excited about it. Instead of getting overwhelmed by how much there is to do, we just get really excited. And we want people to join that have a passion for this as well, because we're going to need education at many different levels. And so I'm just really grateful to be here. Thank you. Michelle, can you define what an occupational therapist does? I think a lot of people may not even know that if you're a parent, what is an occupational therapist? Well, an occupational therapist is a healthcare provider that works on helping a person, regardless of their age, be independent in their activities of daily living. And so for babies, that's going to be the number one activity of daily living is going to be sleep. And we know that there's a, a big interweaving of sleep problems and, and oral dysfunction. But the other big activity of daily living is going to be feeding and nurturing at the breast and nursing and breastfeeding. So that's how an occupational therapist comes in. Also, we're experts at sensory integration. That's how our brain works. It has to get the sensory input in to get the motor output. And it seems very simple and it is complex, but that's what is behind a lot of these problems is not the proper dosing of sensory integration. And so that's what occupational therapists do. And when we start talking about babies, we can overlay things like posture and alignment and symmetry and movement, actually engagement in playful behavior and enjoying. I love Isabel earlier mentioned um, that you know, part of this is so that we don't have reduced joy in our life. And I think that's what we think of with children is joy. And I look around and I'm, you know, I see a paucity of that. And I'm, you know, that's what I think it's all about as well is like enjoying the experience. And, and I'm, you know, I'm known for loving tummy time and I did develop the tummy time method, but I'm really not just about let's get her done tummy time. It's about how can we, how are we engaging meaningfully in our daily life and how does that um, help provoke optimal neural development or not? And um, you know, our breathing is going to be behind that and our connection with other people, our social nervous system is going to be um, a big way of how we regulate our nervous system, especially as we get towards that six month stage. This is another reason why we're, breaking it up into five categories so that we can have experts at each level because we say, well, what can we do? Like I'm a pre-crawling baby expert. And so that's my little niche of these five different areas. We need people who are working with pregnant women as well. And an occupational therapist would work with pelvic floor health and would work with other multidisciplinary professionals as well to use good body mechanics and ergonomics and things change when you have a baby and you're more flexy and bendy and we're prone for injuries after we're, birth, we're born. And an occupational therapist also has a focus on mental health. And that's a big thing too, as we look at babies that are having problems with oral um, function and oral health or even feeding and how that really makes it harder to have um, a good balance of our mental health, especially early postpartum. And I just wanted to ask as well, what are the signs of a baby in stress? Because a lot of parents might not even know what that looks like. You have taught me so much along the way, but what are the signs that that baby is not in an optimal place in their nervous system, for instance? Well, there are both really obvious signs and there are very subtle signs and there's a lot of stuff in between. Something really obvious would be a baby crying. You know, there's two, the two faces of dysregulation are a baby crying and red faced and really upset. And then another face of dysregulation is this sort of flat affect and a tuned out look and really checked out. And, um, but it may not even be, you know, that obvious of a dysregulated state. You know, sometimes it's just the hands and feet are really cool or the baby's having a hard time, even just having reflux symptoms. These type of things they're dealing with a lot from an autonomic uh, nervous system and a digestive standpoint. And if they're having a problem with their position of the tongue or the tone and the strength of their tongue, that's gonna affect their airway. And immediately that's gonna have some breathing problems. So that would be another huge indicator if the baby's breathing fast or hard or their belly's not moving. Um, those are really good um, signs. Yeah. 
You know, I don't think parents know a lot of what is normal and not normal. And again, I just go back to educating the parents to look at what we want with our babies and the sound of breathing or the open mouth posture or even the snoring. A lot of parents don't even have that information. And so my mother, who's still referring to Dr. Spock, she's telling me, no, it's fine. It's fine. And, you know, there's certain foundational speakers about what a baby's development is in different generations. So I feel like we're really coming into an area where the parents are demanding information to know why their baby is behaving a certain way. And they just didn't get it from their primary care pediatrician. And it's not their fault. That's the thing. There's a gap of knowledge. And again, that's really what we're doing here today is to bring this knowledge into the arena and looking at these different categories of a baby's development and how we can support parents and providers with more reference tools that are going to be based on research and the dialogue that we see inside the myofunctional science arena. So yeah. we'll come back to you, Michelle, but thank you so much uh, for thank everything you. you do to educate parents and uh, babies alike. So thank you. I, I want to take that. a moment and uh, take us to the physical therapy world because Cynthia Peterson, who's a physical therapist, she has worked extensively with babies. And a lot of you may think, how does a physical therapist really step into this arena if it's not about feeding or the sensory integration? But her perspective on this is really interesting. And I would love to introduce you, Cynthia. You're here from uh, calling in from Utah and you have really led the charge, not just with the TMJ development and the work that you've done in that area, but really looking at babies parents and the physical therapeutic techniques that can support some of the sensory integration. Thank you so much, Samantha. And I, such an honor to be here. And I applaud the AMS for championing these uh, babies, the, our most vulnerable population. And, I, and I'm so um, honored to be with everyone on the panel. And I do actually have some slides and I've had the opportunity of working actually with all ages. And let me see if I can share my screen. So I believe really treatment for babies should be before pregnancy. It should be really preconception. And so I love the concept of family centered care. And so it, in, it involves all disciplines and I'd love to have more um, MDs as well as DOs, OBs, midwives, doulas, and the whole mis multidisciplinary team. As far as screening, um, you know, I have helped to focus a little more on research and with Dr. Zaghi and multidisciplinary teams. Michelle's heading up the, the infant and screening tool, but we're trying to come up with functional airway screening tools. So this is a website, information's free. We welcome everyone's contributions to try to develop tools that are free and easily accessible that eventually can be validated, but that would help any practitioner to be able to identify airway concerns. And um, again, if we, if we can work with parents' preconception and improve their nasal breathing, their lip seal, get their tongue up, improve their Freeman and Mallon potty scores, help regulate their own autonomic nervous system so that they can help their baby regulate and work on their cranial nerve function before and during pregnancy. Um, as a physical therapist, um, alignment, pelvic alignment is, is, a, is an important piece. And if the mom's pelvis is aligned, that's going to help decrease the risk of obstruction and birth trauma and issues. So that's a, a simple but very profound thing that can be done. Work toward a natural birth when possible, decreasing the need of medications and interventions, getting the baby aligned, delaying cord clamping. There's some really exciting research that I uh, in Australia about, about this delayed cord clamping up to five minutes and guiding using the baby's vital signs to guide when the clamping should be done that would decrease the respiratory distress that often occurs at birth too often occurs. And the breast crawl is a huge, that's what this picture's from. That from a reflex integration standpoint, you know, the baby goes into extension to be born, but then to integrate, 
integrate, that breast crawl would help integrate. And we've fallen away from that natural practice. Um, the kangaroo care and helping mom to regulate. Um, a few other ideas is once the baby's born, just making sure mom and baby connect and that the mom can help regulate the baby in healthy ways. So if the mom's dysregulated, it's going to be harder for her to regulate her own baby. Um, establish breastfeeding when possible. And from the AMS, I'm hearing up to three years. I'm really breastfeeding is myofunctional therapy for babies. So when we can get that working, that's a huge important piece. Um, addressing the birth trauma, um, physically, psychosocially, that first breath, when I see babies with cords around the neck, that, that can be a huge issue. Um, um, head trauma, of course, dural and fascial restrictions, cranial nerve injuries. I think they, one of the studies they came across listed fasc facial nerve injuries, 10 per 1,000. And I would say that's probably underreported from what I see. Those are the severe ones. Um, brachial plexus injuries. We want to establish nasal breathing. I feel like there's so much focus on the tongue. So for example, this baby you can see um, that I was able to treat had had a tongue tie release. The baby was getting the tongue tie, the tongue up, but could not breastfeed. So they had, they had difficulty with head control. They didn't have their lip seal. They, they were dysregulated. But by getting the, their cranial nerve and autonomic nervous system up, you can see within one visit, huge changes. So the nervous system is so important. And often this is overlooked. We're just focused on the tongue and not breathing and some of these other really important pieces. I love Michelle's focus on optimal timing. That's so hugely important. We want to optimize baby's sleep. And I love Karen's work on that. I think it's just, and I'd love to revisit that back to sleep from an airway perspective. Um, I think that that could hugely help babies. And of course, we want to get their cranium balanced, get their head control. I just want to quick comment. There's a lot of research on myofunctional therapy and how hugely helpful it is with um, ankle glossy, with tongue tie release surgery. But in a lot of these instances, they have done in this situation, five sessions of therapy before and five to 12 sessions post-op. So we are not doing that for babies. Babies deserve this. They need this as well. We must prepare them. And if they're prepared, these, these surgery, surgical releases will be so much more beneficial. And um, because I do see, unfortunately, a lot of people, and sometimes it's, the, it's often the parents that are pushing, why would I do any therapy before? Let me just get the release. And then they, they get suboptimal results and there can be issues. So I would advocate for that. And just two, two last points. Can we grow and change jaws? I think this is often missed as well. We need to get when that jaw is small and retruded. And often we know from Takashi Ono's lecture that if the mom has intermittent hypoxia, then the baby's, the alveolar bone growth is diminished. The mandible tends to be smaller and the tongue tends to be bigger. So they wanted to break this baby's jaw. Um, they had some issues. They, I didn't see them till 10 months old, but we were able to, through therapy and working the nervous system as well, get the lips closed, get the jaw growing forward to the point where they didn't need that surgery. And um, I did want to end with this. So this is a, a young, because I see all ages and my focus is on early intervention in babies, but I do still see all ages. And it's really informative because this young guy when he was six weeks old had a tongue tire surgery and it totally saved breastfeeding mom said it was fantastic and yet here he is at six and a half years old with neck pain chronic headaches um some some serious issues he can't lift his tongue at all he's mouth breathing he has postural issues he's making some really amazing progress but he did not have therapy after and I believe if he had had therapy before and after, could have been saved being seeing me at six and a half years old with these issues. So we need to, um, just because babies can't report issues and we're maybe guiding it more by mom's pain, we need to really focus on the baby and their needs and look at what are the long-term outcomes. We haven't really done long-term research of, of what those 
are. And I just feel if a baby does need it, we want them to be ready, one and done, and make it done right. And make sure they integrate emotionally as well as physically. And the scar tissue can remodel for up to a year. It's not just two to three weeks. And the optimal strength is up to 80%. And it's still worth having surgery to get that tongue up. But there are consequences. And we just, again, really want to make sure, just like with the older kids and adults, that they're ready. And we, we do more myofunctional therapy and whole body treatment before and after to just make sure that we're getting best outcomes. Thank you, Cynthia. People don't realize that babies can have therapy before, and it's really part of the protocol as we're moving into how best to serve the tongue tie release and how best to allow the baby to integrate the therapy before and post-procedure, it continues. So I just wanna say, if you're tuning in and you don't know that your baby needs therapy, it's really a big part of this equation. And the therapy is going to enhance the impact of the release itself so that everything can integrate. And this is something that I know you've been working on very diligently and with screening tools to assess for some of these myofunctional disorders. And some people just don't know what a myofunctional disorder is. And I'm talking about the pediatricians and other providers that really are not trained to look for them. So that's where this armada of myofunctional therapists and allied health pro professionals are really filling the gap because we need more education and we need to serve what the baby actually needs. So thank you for all you do, Cynthia. And you're such a passionate clinician and you're really changing lives. Thank you. I want to introduce our next panelist, Deborah Catoni. Deborah is a speech language pathologist. She is, has been working in myofunctional sciences for years. She's the founder of the Brazilian Myofunctional Therapy Association. She is uh, in, integrated and integral in how myofunctional therapy is looked at. And I would love to bring you into this discussion because you have been doing this for many years. And if you could just introduce, uh, what is the primary population you serve in our wheel of age that would help us? And what is it that you do specifically? Hi everyone, good afternoon. It's a great honor to be here and thank you for the invitation. May I share my screen? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark. It's a great pleasure to have you here in, in, our, in my clinic and all your work here with the speech language pathologies and our society myofunctional society. And we have many, many things uh, to talk about in myofunctional field. And I choose to focus today on the importance um, of the chewing development in infants. And I work um, in a private clinic and basically with infants and children and we have the, um, the worry to, um, er, to the early detection of the myofunctional problems and the impact of the myofunction problems on the chewing uh, development. So uh, we, we all know the, the importance of the first 1,000 days and the, the importance of the only breastfeed from birth to six months and the solid food introduction after six months and transition to family diet. And the chewing um, is a learned function and the experience is so, so important. 
And here um, it's, uh, we work with uh, occupa occupational therapies and other um, professional, uh, healthy professionals, because the sensory experience is also very important to the motor learning process um, that the chewing requires. requires. And so the beginning of the food transition, uh, this kind of information is very, very important to provide to all the health professionals, parents, the population, and because we have to expose her to different types. Uh, the, the baby should be exposure, exposure it to different types of food, uh, of consistence, textures, and flavors. And also it's very important, the uh, sens uh, sensory um, integration. And in some infants, uh, we have problems with this. So we um, have to work in a team, with a team. And the... <clears throat> The chewing development, uh, we have many, many points, important points, as you, you to, to, told here today, you, and the nasal, the nasal breathing and the oral habits uh, have um, great impact on the structures of the stomach, stomatognat systems. And also, um, we, are, we are spreading the information here in, in Brazil, and it's important around the world. Uh, the impact of tongue time also in chewing, because in the beginning, we have many research about the impact of the tongue time in breastfeeding. And we also know that we have a great impact in chewing development also. And we have to pay attention to the skills that point the readiness for chewing, such as red support and seat with support. So it's not a work uh, we, we do alone, but we, we need a staff and to evaluate all these points. Um, the baby should bring hands and objects to mouth and the, child, the ch child's interest in seeing, smelling, touching the food. And also the dentists are, uh, uh, are very important because we have the development of the dentition and the all the muscles, the masticatory muscles should be developed and uh, should be developed. And we have the impact, uh, of course, um, by, the prime, the, by, by the primary uh, dentition. And uh, what does the intervention look like? This is one of the questions of the panels. So um, I'm hearing here uh, a lot of very important information and all of you uh, talk about the par parent orientation, par parent education, it's very, very important. And also when we have the infants that not, um, do not uh, develop the, the chewing, we have the, the process of the therapy and we have the playful approach. Mark could see, uh, could see here how I can play with the infants. And we basically um, start with food and investigation about food. And we also have many resources like this one. Uh, with the, the theme, the, the food. So it's very, very important to, to have this, this point in myofunctional science that uh, is the, the focus on the chewing also. Thank you. Thank you the, for the opportunity. Thank you, Deborah. It's been so fun to hear about how much Mark has been energized by when he observed you and 
it really is a tribute to the clinicians out there. If you're listening and you're, the joy you bring into these family systems and the hope and as Michelle had put it, not getting overwhelmed, but getting excited, I mean, <laughs> that comes through you. So it's really just so, you know, it's a tribute to all of the clinicians who are serving families and kids on these different levels all the time. So it's really mm -hmm. wonderful to have your participation today, Deborah. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you a lot. Yeah. Um, I want to bring in another joyful clinician and pediatric dentist, Amy Ludeman Lazar, whose practice in, uh, I believe it's Katy, Texas, correct? Yes. Um, yes. Yes. She has uh, really assembled a collaborative team in her office and is like everyone here today, so passionate about finding the solutions and filling the gaps. Amy, thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much, Samantha, for inviting me. This is really an honor, as everyone said, and um, it's super exciting to think about starting this journey. Um, I think some people sometimes have said, you know, can't do baby myo, right, because babies can't do therapy or follow along with you, but it's missing the point. And the point is, is that um, it's important in all the stages, as everyone's talked about, from prenatal, um, I think an answer to that question, like just noticing a small jaw, if the OBs were noticing that and sort of giving a little bit of information of parent to parents to be on the lookout for what that could mean, um, I think people, almost everyone has said how important it is to have sort of a team leader for the parents. I think of it as a quarterback. Um, that's very important along the way um, to help them to know so they don't get switched from service to service, which happens a lot when there are developmental issues or, or feeding concerns or speech concerns. Um, but for me as a pediatric dentist, yes, we have um, like Elal Boltz, or we have an um, osteopath, we have lactation consultants, myofunctional therapy, and um, we in our clinic have that going on, but also um, we work with PTs and, and everyone, ENTs, pediatricians outside, and really try to collaborate for each and every child. And one thing that hasn't been mentioned a lot, um, but I think that's important, everyone's talked about informing parents, and I'm very passionate about that. Um, and so we've made some videos, for example, um, but what I like to do when I treat a tongue tie on an infant, one is we make sure they're ready. So I have to have someone like Michelle and someone like Katrina both say, Yes, we've addressed everything that can be addressed except for the structure that we need your help on, and they're ready for the procedure to have a great outcome. But I'm going to still tell parents of all the things I want them to look for in the first few years of life. And I get to see my babies usually every six months for the first three months of life, which is phenomenal, because even if the parent and the pediatrician have missed the palate still really high, or the child's mouth breathing, or they're now showing some signs of a lack of restorative sleep, um, I can look at the structures, which is really important, and the structures tell the story. So even if I release the tongue tie and breastfeeding went great and they never went to see their IBCLC or body worker again, but they get back to me at six months and we're having you know, eating issues, gagging, choking, we're having small jaws, still retronathia. These are all things that um, we tell the parents from day one. These are all the things that say, even though I'm treating your tongue tie today, these are all the things that say your tongue is not functioning or the baby's tongue is not functioning. So if this is happening or this is happening or this is happening, call me back. It may not be me that needs to see you. It may not be that the frenum is the problem, but we need to find out what is the problem, get to the root cause and address it. And so I just think it's so valuable because if the parents know what to look for, of course, we want the pediatricians to know what to look for and we want everybody else to know what to look for. But if the parents know not just what's um, common nowadays, but what's normal and what's going to get their child their best face, jaw, and airway from early on, um, I think like everyone has said, then the parents are going to drive that the, the providers know and understand and help. And that's what we see in our practice is that a lot of times the parents are the ones that have said, ah, you know, my pediatrician said a little bit of snoring is fine or this is fine or that's fine. But my gut said it wasn't fine and I read some things and so now I'm here. And so, yeah, it's, um, it's really fun. This is a wonderful time to be a pediatric dentist. I think I have the best job in the whole wide world because I get to collaborate with so many amazing providers and just get to help collaborate with the parents to help their child live their best life. And it's, it's a wonderful thing. So thank you for having me.
question about timing of intervention. When you are seeing your patients for the first time, a lot of parents don't really realize the dentist has a, a role in the early infancy years. So what do you recommend? So the current recommendation is at one year or six months after the first teeth erupt. Um, however, mm -hmm. if you have a child with an oral restriction, and to me, it doesn't matter if a pediatrician, midwife, or ENT has treated it, that child already has a structural problem. As you mentioned, they come out with a high palate. So um, I think a pediatric dentist, even at six months, would be wonderful because that's when we can start. For us in our clinic, we can do neonatal ALF. We can do a lot of things, which the earlier we intervene, the less expensive it is and the faster it is to help them. And sometimes um, they need help with that structure. Um, so six months to a year after the one years old or six months after the first teeth erupt. But if you have a child with an oral restriction and you have a savvy pediatric dentist who helps with growth and development guidance, um, then that's a great person to have um, on the team early on, um, in my opinion. May I, may I add something? Yeah. Uh, yes, that unfortunately, please, today's uh, the curriculum of a pediatric dentist anywhere in the world doesn't include any of this. Any, sure. maybe they, they uh, make a note about the freedom. Maybe they make a note about, uh, maybe that's it. Yeah. So yeah. we have a long way to put it into the curriculum of, the pedi of dentistry and pediatric dentistry. Until then, it's only self-taught uh, dentists. So saying a pediatric dentist is a long way from what we are talking about. That's it a good point. Be. You have to find someone that has had the extra training. Okay, can I ask Katrina, a did you want to mention? Go ahead, Katrina. Um, a Amy, what's the earliest that you um, provide an ALF? At what, at what age? It can be in the first weeks of life for a neonatal ALF. Right. Um, and so that's helping to reshape the palate um, and doing other things. Uh, but for children that have teeth, it would be as, as soon as the E's are in. That's, that's, that's great to know. And I think very relevant for, you know, some of the, some of the children that we see with very high arch palates and those yeah. at risk groups like the Nick, the babies coming out of, of Nikki and Kibu. Um, thanks. Yeah, thank <laughs> you. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Unfortunately, so much of the work that we're looking at has been caused by our modern society and the industrial age as a period of history, which really marked the downfall of the human race. And the next panelist I want to bring in is Robert Lustig, who is not a clinician treating myofunctional disorders per se, but his influence in the world, he's a pediatric endocrinologist, has really elevated the awareness of the biochemistry and the, the processes involved of the nutrition on children and the population at large. Robert, it's wonderful to have you here today. I would love you to weigh in from your perspective on what you see in this discussion and how we need to advance our discussion further. So first of all, thanks very much for having me, Samantha and Mark and all of you. Um, I'm also uh, speaking on behalf of my colleague and friend, Kevin Boyd. Uh, we put our uh, thoughts together in a big pot, stirred it around, and now I'm basically going to give you um, a scrambled version of, uh, of uh, sure uh, physiology, anatomy, and uh, biochemistry all at once. Um, there are four separate phenomena that are increasing in prevalence and severity around the world, and they're all going up all at the same time. Obesity, chronic disease, you all know that, malocclusion, and um, uh, what was the last one? Obesity, chronic disease, malocclusion, and um, then like in the worst, last one. Uh, anyway, let's do the, 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 the three that I, I can remember. Um, Karen knows. Did you want to say what the fourth one is, Karen? The greedy? Yes, right, right. Episode of the way of destruction, right. So the bottom line, that's right, uh, OSA. So the bottom line is that there are two parts to 
um, the entry to the airway. There's the maxilla and there's the mandible. The maxilla grows by cancellous bone growth and the, and the mandible grows by long bone growth. And they are, not, they are not the same. We've learned from Takashi Ono that intermittent hypoxia can influence that mandibular bone growth and end up with micrognathia, which ultimately can lead to obstructive airway disease uh, going forward. And we know that also from growth hormone deficient patients as well. They have reduced mandibular size until they uh, get growth hormone. Uh, the question is, the maxilla has equal importance in terms of this and how big that palatal vault is. And there the question is, what's pushing on that? It's cancellous bone growth. And that is kind of like the sutures of the, of the head. Uh, we have this phenomenon that we take care of in pediatrics called craniosynostosis, where the sutures fuse too soon and prevent brain growth and can cause significant uh, developmental delay retardation unless it's released. Well, there are incisive sutures in the maxilla that have to be pushed on in order to grow the maxilla, in order to be able to expand the palatal vault, in order to increase the airway. So these two phenomena are going on at the same time and could potentially be related to each other, but not necessarily. They could be separate things. They could be, for instance, uh, a tongue tie leading to decreased ability of the tongue to be able to put pressure on the incisive suture to grow the maxilla. It could instead be intermittent hypoxia from placental insufficiency that led to mandibular uh, 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 dysfunction. <coughs> Uh, it could be uh, uh, myopathy. Uh, I took care of many patients in obesity clinic who had an inherent underlying subclinical myopathy that I could tell when I would do passive stretch of muscles in clinic. And when I put these patients on dextroamphetamine to increase adrenergic stimulation of muscles, they basically woke up, they started exercising spontaneously, and they started losing weight. So there are probably different phenomena and different inputs to these two, pheno to these two uh, variables. That is the variable of the mandible and the variable of the maxilla. Some of them are endocrine, some of them are mechanical, some of them have to do with nutrition, some of them have to do with anatomy like tongue tie. But these various uh, things all ultimately go into this pot in terms of how well the airway grows. And if the airway doesn't grow, you're going to end up with OSA, and OSA is going to end up leading to changes in uh, metabolic parameters later on, which ultimately lead to chronic disease. The best time to deal with this is immediately. The best time to deal with this is during babyhood. And as a pediatrician, you know, I can vouch for that. So I am in complete support of this notion. The one thing I would caution you to is that everything I've heard on this panel today is absolutely true and I support all of it. But what has to be done is it has to be integrated into a framework, into an algorithm on how you take all of these things into account when you evaluate a patient so you can determine what is the proper thing to do. Uh, you know, basically if you have a hammer, everything's a nail. So if you're a tongue tie surgeon, everything's about tongue tie. That's not right. Okay. If you're a, um, you know, if you're uh, trying to grow the mandible, you know, everything's going to be about, you know, crozats and things like that. The bottom line is you have to, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's an algorithm. It's a differential. Uh, we have to basically uh, use our co collective knowledge in terms of putting it together to create the differential and then hopefully be able to introduce that differential into pe both pediatric dentistry and pediatric medicine and occupational therapy in order to be able to uh, effectuate a, a rational change in the system and in our babies. I really do appreciate you connecting these dots because it does take another perspective to see the overall picture and these functions are so intricate depending and always in every stage of development. So the algorithm is always going to change accordingly. And that's something that I think you are really shedding light on, which is the, 
the layers and the patterns so that we can get a wider perspective on what we call a myofunctional approach to treatment. And it's very helpful. And it also is a lot of work because we have so many disciplines involved and everyone is really going to stay inside their scope of practice. So then the idea is if we can have a collective algorithm, as you say, then we can start to see the patterns and work together more effectively as well. So the thank reason, you, Robert. The reason this has fallen between the cracks is because this occupies a, uh, a niche between uh, specialties, between disciplines, between fields. You know, the pediatrician is the first person to see the patient doesn't know a thing about this. You've already demonstrated the pediatric dentists are, you know, don't know anything about this. You know, the occupational therapist may know there's a problem, but they don't necessarily know what it is that they need to do in order to be able to uh, manage it. Ultimately, we have to come together uh, perhaps it means the spawning of a completely new field. You know, certainly a white paper will get us there. But oh, uh, you know, th this is going to require you know input and you know uh, 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 co contributions from everyone in order to be able to you know make something that's rational and introducible to uh, to clinical medicine. Well, I agree. It does take uh, more than a village. It's a global community and we have a global community here and experts and leaders. So that is exciting because people are really going to be allowed this opportunity to weigh in. And if you're out there watching, we're going to wrap this up soon. If you have any questions that you wanna ask a panelist, please do. I wanna pass the camera over to Karen Spreut, whose work has really supported so much of our organization here at the AAMS, but also her specific interest in the brain development and the neuroscientific approach to understanding these gaps, whether it's in the sleep physiology or other uh, functions that we've been discussing today. Karen, thank you for being with us. Hi, thank you, Samantha, for having me. Um, I'm gonna start straight ahead um, um, and a little bit with out of the box kind of thinking uh, because I've been uh, joining you and all of us have been joining everybody on this uh, endeavor of myofunctional uh, uh, therapy and the orofacial area. And I think um, as the outlier and uh, already the conference, the virtual conference uh, shows it, is um, we are being pushed by COVID uh, in very alternative way of thinking and uh, acting. And I think in terms of myofunctional therapy and the orofacial area, um, you know, COVID, we wear a mask and it's that area where we are hampered in terms of our breathing, in terms of our feeding, in terms of the function, in terms of its uh, sensory motor stimulation. And COVID is learning us the lesson that this is a very unpleasant uh, um, uh, aspect. So imagine, imagine that you start life where exactly that area of breathing and feeding and um, social communication is being jeopardized by a myofunctional uh, problem or dysfunction. So um, that brings us again to what I've heard in uh, many of these, from many different um, specialties, is an increased awareness, an increased awareness, uh, the promotion of bottom-up approach where parents really push the professionals and the sleep field. Um, but like you said, Samantha, um, probably the core is sharing knowledge, sharing knowledge and the transfer of knowledge. And I think indeed maybe it is not uh, um, scientific knowledge, um, but there is a clinical uh, experience and so which needs to be scientifically uh, expressed. And one of the, the, the problems or the bottlenecks might be that there is a wide range of specialties involved um, and especially what we've heard from the start in the NICU, uh, but also in neonatal care and go on. Huh? So the preschoolers, the toddlers, all of them actually have all their um, specialties or um, healthcare professionals that jump in with their hammer, with their uh, um, uh, framework, and uh, they start. But 
um, as uh, Robert just said, you know, this niche, this subspecialty, you know, that one that connects many other specialties is very uh, important. And as part of these specialties involved, each of us has, and especially from the sleep field, but also from the developmental neuropsychology field, we have these milestones, we have these toolkits or um, uh, algorithms where we know, uh, you know, which, with which tools we can screen, which tools um, we should start our intervention, when we should start our intervention, um, and at what a developmental milestone specifically in terms of myofunctional development. Um, uh, we need to come to that consensus, and I agree, white papers is uh, the way forward. So I juggled another point down is that um, in part of these um, uh, scientific knowledge and uh, uh, skill set versus the ex uh, clinical experience, you know, just in lay terms, very, very uh, common lay terms, I have a fuzzy baby. I have a fuzzy baby. So what is wrong? And so people just, you know, they start to check off. And so um, one of the uh, automatic question or thing that should be thought about is, you know, the breathing, you know, as we've heard, the tongue tie plays a role, the palate plays a role, the open mouth, you know, the breathing aspect, the feeding aspect. Again, all these elements uh, pop up. Um, and combined with that is the sleeping uh, aspect because um, as you are born very early on, what you do is, you know, you sleep, you feed, you sleep, you feed, you get your, you know, this is, you know, your rhythm, which gradually develops in terms of a, a sleep feeding interaction, uh, more interaction. And so we back, you know, the core of the, the, the lead uh, path to this um, feeding, you know, sleeping and uh, interacting is that orofacial area, is that... Uh, functioning and is that sensory mode development. So if I now go back to this um, sleep and how important sleep is, because that is, you know, um, the waking, um, the waking state is one of the last ones um, to mature. So um, we sleep and then it's actually our waking state that uh, protrudes or comes into this um, sleeping state, feed and then to interact and then in terms of your preschoolers and toddlers to learn. So in learning, we've heard from the speech uh, uh, therapists, you know, is this, again, this area is very important. So um, I think we're making a very big mistake if we are not drawing uh, more attention and if we are not um, uh, critically, you know, reflecting on how important this area is from the very start, from the very beginning in life, through the rest of your life. And I think that is one of the terms that was uh, mentioned as well, because this area will have, you know, and any dysfunction to this area will have long last lasting health effects. So timing is crucial. And as uh, Robert mentioned, especially, you know, because of this plasticity um, for skeletal growth. So coming back to the neurodevelopment, Sleep is important, but sleep will be, you know, protected if the child is well fed, if the child has uh, the interaction, and then, you know, you have a good cocktail for an optimal brain development. Coming back, you know, if we have not yet after, you know, two months of a conference and uh, a rising COVID um, ep uh, epidemic, um, I think this mask and the fact that we are, you know, using and, and hampering, you know, the functions and the sensory motor stimulation of this area due to COVID, I think this really, you know, needs to make us think uh, uh, one step further um, and reflect on, you know, how important myofunctional therapy is if we start it right from very early on and actually have all the disciplines the uh, sufficient awareness, potentially promotion, and um, the sharing of the information, our skill set that we already have. So um, thank you for uh, uh, having me, and thank you for allowing me to sit in, in many of these uh, sessions. I have learned a lot, um, and, uh, and I think all of us are very much engaged uh, uh, through this conference, and I'm looking forward to move this 
further on uh, in terms of research. So thank you. Thank you, Karen. You summarize and sum up so many aspects and the understanding about the breathing during this zeitgeist of COVID is such a relevant topic. And I know that will be explored further and is being explored. So we hope that we can um, come back to that. I want to have Katrina Rogers share with us a patient because as a clinician, she's really stepping in usually the last resort and it will uh, we'll start to wind down soon, but I wanted to have her share some of the work that she's doing and some of the issues that you can see visually as well. So go ahead, Katrina, share your screen. And uh, as a specialist in dysphagia, you're really looking at these functions around chewing, breathing, swallowing. So uh, thank you again. Thank, thank you so much. Um, so as, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yep. So um, as, um, as part of this forum, um, some of you may well have met um, Lucy and her little girl, Evelyn. Lucy was on the um, patient forum. And Lucy, I took some of the questions um, that have been on the flyer to Lucy. Um, Lucy's interesting because she's a mom of a, of a child with a tongue tie who's had plagia carefully, who has movement issues. Um, and um, had when she when she arrived, um, her she had a grim clinical um, picture. And as as a therapist um, as well, you, you know she's had to 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 um, have knowledge alongside of this. But her emotions have been very caught into this um, into this. Um, difficult situation in her management um, of Evelyn's feeding and I've had the opportunity to share um, this journey with her um, with her con with her consent because I know her so well but um, so I just um, met with Lucy the other day and some of the things that she shared because Evelyn um, had her tongue to had a tongue tie and one of the things as um Evelyn was born um and looking at um you know the goals of a white paper and we need to think about gestation and the health and welfare of, of mum of mums and for um Lucy in the context um Lucy had polyhydraminous with uh, when she was carrying Evelyn. And as part of um, my work and my presentation, I looked at a number of fetal swallow, swallow studies, and there are a number of studies out there looking at early markers um, of risk to swallowing in utero and looking at, at um, uh, this to predict postnatal feeding difficulties. And actually, what we need to be thinking if there is evidence um, and uh, studies out there and um, do we need to be looking at um, asking these questions when we meet um, parents of um, babies who are struggling to feed and is this a marker for, for tongue tie? Um, but uh, what Lucy's com some of Lucy's comments were um, that uh, there is a need for tongue tie assessment and risks to early feeding to be included in a newborn screen. And what she felt um, on discussion was that nobody really um, knew or there was, was different perceptions um, uh, about tongue tie. Some people within our trust, uh, you, you, know, you know, acknowledge tongue tie, but there is, isn't joined up thinking. And she was really frustrated in um, uh, seeking help for Evelyn where um, is, there isn't there. She was very aware that her other daughter had had a tongue tie and she shared straight away to the midwife um, at, 
at the birth, has my child got a tongue tie? And the midwife acknowledged that this baby did have a tongue tie, um, but the treatment wasn't there for, wasn't there for her. And she had to um, struggle um, to try to breastfeed um, this little girl who, um, who didn't have a timely release. So there is not a shared consensus on risks and impact of tongue tied feeding. And I think that we need to kind of, um, and I, I think many of us have spoken about um, education, education um, of parents, education of professionals. There's a lot of research now and the AMS Congress have, have kind of highlighted more and more and more. And, and it's, about sharing that and informing, um, in, informing early early feeding certainly, but um, looking after these 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 babies. Um, so she Lucy needed to seek private um, support to have her tie her daughter's tie released, but she shared also that there was reduced ex expertise in the aftercare and the repatterning of oral facial muscles to optimize feeding potential. And as Cynthia shared, it's not just about release. Um, uh, it's also looking at um, those other aspects to support the repatterning um, and um, reducing areas of tension in those uh, overworked muscles in the oral facial um, complex. And she also shared that the conflict between understanding of form and function between professionals due to different different professionals, different perceptions of need. And I myself, I come across um, where I will need to push for a child to have a tongue to release. But you take a child um, to me with um, ENT, for example, and an ENT who maybe isn't very impact on function is kind of like... Um, no, we're not going to do anything because the um, form looks fine, but the function um, is, diminished, is diminished. So it's, it's having those frustrations. Um, so I, I just um, printed that slide, slide up, but have um, spoke, spoken, spoken through. I think that um, uh, what Lucy, some of Lucy's comments, though, where that linked to the lack of professional knowledge, she really felt a sense of failure and despair in feeding. And she um, ended up um, feeling very judged with wet regular weigh-ins. Um, Avelyn also needed um, to be tube fed for, for a period, which was very distressing. Lucy really wanted to uh, breastfeed Avelyn um, and that was her intention. And feeding then um, walked across to bottle feeding, bottle feeding failed, then it was to tube. And then suddenly, as Avelyn um, met her growth um, chart milestones, um, she, Lucy was keen to re-breastfeed, but um, that wasn't really um, acknowledged. And it was this point around getting as much nutrition inside her daughter by whatever means. So the psychology was really um, affected between um, her and Avelyn. Um, and this is Avelyn. <laughs> and she had played Joe carefully and um, required um, the a helmet to support her head shape. And we progressed her with her feeding um, and, and weaning um, and um, just to, to give you <laughs> some of those images. <laughs> Um, but Lucy, Lucy um, commented, actually, the psychological impact, it's more than just the passing on of nutrition and really um, considered, please, please support breastfeeding. You know, mums want to 
want to breastfeed, um, I think Al's mentioned um, 76% or start off 97%, 76% drop, but it's, it's a natural thing to do. But the healthcare system, um, in my experience, <coughs> doesn't um, does it doesn't support it um and it's also impact on mum's health and well-being it's and lucy said i can't hear that i can't even feed my baby i can't even feed my baby with um with the with bottle feeding and where, as Evelyn went on to have her tube, Evelyn shared she was very removed from the feeding process. Um, it, it was kind of the psychology was gone. And you think about the impact on ch um, mum, child bonding, um, how devastating that is. You know, as a communication therapist where you have babies in distress, and the, the impact of that on the interaction, you, you know, the early interaction and the breakdown in communication in that. But breast, what Lucy shared, and, and Evelyn is just um, 13 months now, but she, she shared that the, the person who was really promoting breastfeeding within the medical circles was the lactation consultant, but the support wasn't there from other practitioners because there was this big focus on volume of milk, milk feed, um, and getting enough inside. And it was a, a massive, massive stress um, for, the, for the family who, you, you, you know, a Evelyn has made progress and come through, come through um, with support, but um, it's just um, really interesting um, for for those insights to be shared. Okay. Um, and um, I just uh, felt it was timely to share that with the rest of the group. <laughs> so thank, thank you, you, Katrina. Well, you did really summarize so much of what our entire forum has been about. It's the gestation period, supporting the mother as she's growing the baby, the gestation period itself, and the impact of breathing of the mother on the fetus. And then beyond that, these phases of treatment and the gaps that we're trying to fill just by the exchange of knowledge and the parent perspective on how stressful that is as we are formulating what we hope to be more of a, an algorithmic approach, but also a patterned approach in this area of myofunctional sciences. So thank you for sharing that and say thank you to our speakers. Go gallery view because I want everyone to see who is here today and their contributions. This is all going to be recorded and uh, put out into the world again, in case you weren't able to m catch the whole thing. But we are so indebted to our presenters and our speakers who are bringing the knowledge that we're carrying forward. So thank you again. All of you have really been instrumental in how we are moving this needle of medicine to another stage in how we treat patients with myofunctional disorders. So be there or be square. Dress up uh, for the closing ceremony, black tie optional, uh, right? Sure, yeah. Okay, let's, let's rock it, baby. AAMSinfo.org. <laughs> Giddy up, tongue wranglers. Yeehaw! <laughs> Yeehaw! Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs> thank, thank you so thank much. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>